What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Observant Lyman. I am your Observant Lyman, Uche Waneri. And today, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the psychology and the mental processes that players deal with uh, in times of frustration. Now, I think back for me personally, in my time in Jacksonville as a Jaguar, uh, there were certainly times where I was frustrated as a player uh, with the progress of the team. And to get specific with that, uh, I look no further than my 2011-2012 season in Jacksonville. Now, this year in Jacksonville was a particularly bad year for the Jaguars, and it was a particularly frustrating season for myself. Uh, we had a new head coach in Mike Malarkey. Uh, after we had had uh, Jack Del Rio, I was drafted by Jack Del Rio's staff. And <clears throat> over my course of time as a player with Jack Del Rio, uh, he earned a very large amount of respect from me personally because of how he approached uh, dealing with players, because of his approach uh, in games and his aggressiveness in trying to go do whatever he could to go after the win. But uh, when we switched, when Del Rio was let go and then the job was given to Mike Malarkey, uh, there, was, there, was a few, there were a few questions about where the team would go and what progress we would make in that 2011-2012 season. Um, for me, a new experience with a new head coach was uh, not necessarily the preferred uh, route of, of uh, movement in trying to, uh, and trying and, try, and the team trying to achieve its goals of getting back in the playoffs and uh, being relevant uh, in regards to postseason play. Uh, we had three seasons in a row where we actually missed the playoffs in the final game of the season under Jack Del Rio. And the ownership decided that it was time to move in a new direction. So they hired Mike Malarkey. And in that time, in that season with Mike Malarkey, I actually felt as though the Jaguars uh, had made a huge mistake in bringing someone with his kind of mentality about how to approach preparing a team for a football game uh, in, in, in our organization. And, <clears throat> you know, from the, from the outset, you could see that there was a similar uh, sentiment among the players. His style of coaching was very old school. His style of coaching was rooted in repetitive destruction, uh, meaning that uh, we practiced full pads all the time high tempo, full contact, and a lot of players uh, were turned off by that. Now, why were players turned off? Well, we felt that, in all honesty, we were wasting a ton of energy in practice, and that took away from our ability to perform on Sundays. I'll never forget, we were in week, I think it was week five of the 2011-2012 season, and... This is after pregame warmups. We're about to play against the Jets at home. And we're in the locker room after pregame warmups. And guys just had this look on their face. They had this look of just total exhaustion. Just complete uh, lack of energy. Uh, guys were not ready to play. I could tell. I could feel it. Other players could feel it. And uh, Eugene Monroe, who was uh, our left tackle at the time, comes over to my locker and he sits down next to me and he looks at me dead in the eyes and he says, Ooch, are you as dead tired as I am? And I looked right back at him and I said, yeah. I said, I am not ready to play. I don't even know if I can play. My legs feel like cinder blocks and we just did warm-ups. It wasn't we haven't even 
gone through a, any portion of the game yet. One of our defensive backs, Dwight Lowry, also walks up to my locker while me and Eugene are sitting there kind of just staring at each other like, what are we going to do? Uh, Dwight Lowry walks over, and he was a former Jet. So, I mean, this, if anything, would have been a game that he'd be you know a lot more up for uh, because he's playing against his former team. He comes over to our locker, or to my locker where me and Eugene are, in front of us, he stands there, he looks at us with this look in his eyes like, I don't know. I don't know. And he says, guys, I'm finished. I don't have no energy. I have nothing for this game today. And we looked at each other in this little triangle of players, and we just kind of let out this sad and pathetic giggle amongst each other like yo <laughs> I, I, I can't do it today and this is week five week five now we would go on to play that season out and and we would be three and 13 i believe was our record at the end of that year but that game was was a was a that game provided a huge moment for a lot of players in the locker room because after the game we ended up losing uh by a little bit and i mean you could just feel it i mean the first play of the game we had a run we called the run play we come off the ball and i feel like i'm almost just leaning on the defensive lineman that i'm trying to block because i'm just i just don't have the burst i don't have the explosion the quick twitch wasn't there and we all come in the locker room after the game, after we have to li sit there and listen to, you know, how we need to, uh, we need to work harder and we need to get some more reps at uh, being able to finish the game. And we all look at each other. Players are just looking at each other left and right. It was a solemn uh, mood after the game, not the solemn mood in terms of losing, but solemn in, ter in terms of guys just feeling like they were close to giving up just because we were so exhausted from the continuous drumming that we took in practices every day, you know, and we know, you know, you talk to players on other teams and players on other teams are like, y'all are still in pads. They're looking at us like we stopped doing pads two weeks into training camp. We stopped doing pads after the first game of the season, you know, and for me, this was right after I just signed a contract extension with the Jags. So, you know, I'm sitting here in my locker and, and throughout the following weeks of the season, guys would repeat the, sen the sentiment of just not having the energy to go out and play. Guys were desperate to find a way to gather energy, to, to build energy, to get uh, to get their body up to play. And that's unusual for a team when, you know, we're so used to, you know, practicing and then going out and playing and having that energy because of management, you know, of, of your, of the resources around you to help you uh, get prepped for the next game. And, <clears throat> you know, I could say in that year, cause I also ended up hurting my knee, which a lot of people didn't know about. I had a knee injury, that st that actually uh, I, I got my, my knee was injured in the first day of training camp uh, go on a one-on-one -on -one pass rush scenario against Tyson Alualu. Uh, you know, our knees collided and I ended up tearing my meniscus uh, and tearing a little bit of my cartilage in, in the back of my knee. <clears throat> and it was a situation where my knee would swell up. My knee would just get, you know, huge during the week and I'd have to ice it and I'd drag it behind me and, uh, you know, going from meeting room to meeting room. And in that season, I did not like being in Jacksonville. I didn't like playing football. I was depressed. I was, I had a little, a lot of anxiety out on the field because the injury wasn't allowing me to play, uh, in certain ways, it wouldn't allow me to, to play the way I wanted to play, the way I was used to playing, the way that I played in the previous season that got me all AFC honors. Um, so, you know, I was battling that mentally. 
And on top of that, there was no let up because of uh, the style of practices that we had. We did not come out of full pads until week 13. We went full pads on Wednesdays and Thursdays during the full season until week 13, which was absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous. And the team suffered for it. So when I sit here and I, and I, and you know, if I'm, if I take a step back and I'm being, a uh, 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 being open-minded about what's going on with this Jalen Ramsey situation, there is some relatability there with players being frustrated in the franchise. And it's not just, you know, just singling out Jacksonville here. It's really uh, just in the nature of sports, there are some uh, styles that are completely counterproductive to uh, teams improving and teams building. So for me in this season, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I'm at my house uh, uh, one week after practice. I think it was on a, on a Wednesday. It was either Wednesday or Thursday. I'm sitting at my house and I'm just thinking to myself, you know, because I was really seriously dealing with, you know, a bit of depression due to what I was dealing, you know, what I was dealing with my injury and the fact that I just was, I had no energy. Like I was losing all interest in playing football that year and called my agent and I told him, I said, look, this season's going horrible. You know what's going on with my knee. Uh, you know, I'm out there playing. I'm out there, you know, playing as hard as I can. And, you know, by the way, I played uh, solely because of Toradol. Uh, I had a Toradol shot at, uh, before every game, and I would not even step out on the field to play a game if, if I if my if I didn't have a, a shot and an anti-inflammatory on top of it, so that I couldn't feel my leg. Uh, when I was pass setting, when I was, you know, run blocking wasn't wasn't bothered by the injury, but pass setting absolutely was. Every pass set felt like my leg was going to just collapse on itself. Uh, but, you know, the Toradol and the anti-inflammatories were, you know, that's what I lived by on Sundays. If I didn't have that, I wasn't going to play. Um, but, you know, I called my agent, Jordan Moy. And I said, look, Jordan, I don't want to be here. I'm tired of being here. And, you know, he kind of laughed a little bit and said, what do you mean? You just signed a five-year extension. What do, you, what do you mean? I said, dude, we are getting buried here. We are getting put through the ringer every single day. Players are complaining behind the scenes that they don't want to play for this guy anymore. And it was crazy because never in my entire career as a football player have I ever gotten to a point where I was like, I don't want to go play. You know, regardless of whether we were winning or losing, I always felt like the underdog role was, you know, a spot to, uh, was a role to relish because, you know, putting in the work and putting in the effort, you can literally, uh, you know, upset teams and beat teams that you're not supposed to beat. And I told Jordan, I said, look, if they don't fire this guy by the end of the year, please call the front office, ask them to trade me. I don't want to play here with this coach any longer. And, you know, no, nobody really knows that because my, you know, my agent didn't release any of that information. He didn't leak that to anybody. And I didn't tell anybody else. It was just me and him on the phone. You know, my wife didn't even hear me say that. Like, I, I, was, in a, <laughs> I was in my game room by myself talking to him. And I told him, I don't want to play here another year with this guy as a head coach. Because he has come in. He's changed the entire culture of this organization for the worse. And I feel like, you know, those thoughts and that sentiment was validated because at the end of the season... They fired him. And I think that it was, uh, you know, I think it was a great decision by Shad Khan. I think he saw what some of the players, uh, including myself, were, were kind of uh, letting off our vibe 
that we just were not, this guy was not the guy, he did not, he was not a good fit for the Jaguars, for the squad that we had and what we were trying to get accomplished. He wasn't the guy to do it. He brought this old school Pittsburgh Steeler, Bear Bryant mentality where the only thing that could get a team better was more pay. You know, more uh, testing of, of a player's toughness instead of better strategy, instead of fresher players, guys who are more more ready to play on Sundays. So this really, uh, you know, like I said, this really did affect my mentality about uh, about football that season. And, I, and I'll never forget, uh, we played against the New England Patriots second to the last game of the season, and I got a concussion that game. Uh, I, you know, I ended up getting a helmet under my chin on a trap play where I had to do a quick pull and I'm going up against a defensive tackle who is literally out of control, falling forward because he's not expecting that guard to, to, you know, bypass him up the field on the block. So he's falling forward, head down, eyes down, and his helmet just clacks right across my jaw. And I mean, it just whipped my head. My head whipped back and forth. And I went blank. And that was like, and we were going on the third down. And I got, got back to the huddle. And, you know, a couple of players were like, hey, Ooch, you all right? Like, you, you good? Because they could see my eyes were like this big. And, you know, uh, Dave Garrard comes in the huddle. He calls, uh, he calls a pass play, 63 base. I'll never forget the play call. Because it was the most bizarre situation ever. He called 63 base. And this is a basic pass protection. Four down to the Mike linebacker. That's the offensive line's responsibility. And I turn to Brad Meester as we're walking to the line of scrimmage. And I say, Brad, what is 63 base? And he looks at me and he's like, what? What do you mean what's 63 base? I said, what is 63 base? And we're walking to the line of scrimmage. At this point. And I said. I don't know what I'm supposed to do on this play. And he's like are you shitting me Uche? It's 63 base. And he's in his stance with his hand on the ball. Looking at me the whole time. What are you talking about? He's like dude are you are you, are you alright? I said dude what is 63 base? He says just block this guy with me. This guy. I'm like okay. After that play, I get off to the sideline. I, you know, they take me to the back, concussion protocol. I don't come back out. Fast forward to uh, Wednesday of the, of the final game week against Tennessee. I walk into the locker room. You know, I'm still having, like, headaches. I can't really, like, I can't look so much at light. I definitely can't look at anything that's on a screen. And, uh, you know, I haven't practiced. You know, I was, I was not scheduled to practice. Uh, our head trainer, Mike Ryan, comes up to me and says, Ooch, um, so uh, just so you know, you know, head man, head coach wants to, uh, you know, make sure that we can get you passed on that protocol test, uh, you know, maybe get you back in practice by Friday. And I looked at him and I laughed. I said, <laughs> I said, Mike, look, you go tell them, you go tell the head coach, you go tell the GM, you go tell the owner, whoever you want. You tell them I ain't playing this week. I don't give a damn what nobody says. I know how I feel right now. There's no way it's happening. I'm not playing. Let them know that. And don't even consider me to come out there and play. And at this point, I've started 61 games in a row and have not missed an, a game in four seasons. So there's something to lose by not playing this week. But obviously, I'm not putting my body or my mind at risk by stepping out on that field knowing that I'm still concussed. Because I didn't end up passing that concussion protocol uh, for another three and a half weeks. My co cognitive skills were not uh, at or above the baseline that we did at the beginning of the season for four and a half weeks. Let that sink in. When you see a concussion, and they said my, my concussion was mild. When you see a concussion, a player uh, who receives a concussion... Chances that they come back in a week, even two weeks, should be slim to none. Because, like I said, I couldn't stare at a computer screen for about three weeks, and I couldn't pass a concussion protocol test for four and a half weeks. 
with a mild concussion. So to bring this full uh, story full circle, uh, you know, this guy wanted me to be out on the field with a concussion. And this guy brought a culture of, of overworking, overbearing practice and uh, prep for games that took a Jacksonville team that had a lot of talent and buried it behind a three and 13 record. And like I said, he was fired at the end of the season and that alone saved, uh, you know, myself from, from actually requesting to be traded because my agent called me at the end of the year after they fired him. This is before Gus Bradley came in after they fired him. And he said, Hey, just want to let you know they fired Malarkey. Do you want me to still call them and request that you be traded? And I thought about it for a minute because at that point, I felt like, you know, that season had put my entire career in jeopardy. And I gave it a couple of days. I told him I'd give him a call back. And I gave it a couple of days. I ended up calling him and telling him, no, you know what? I, I love being in Jacksonville. I love being a Jaguar. I just didn't love the situation that this coach brought to the Jaguars. And I felt like if this guy was going to be here for four years as his contract was, that I wanted nothing to do with it. And not because of the city of Jacksonville, not because of the record we even had, uh, but because of what he had instilled into this franchise as an acceptable way to get a team ready to play a game. And I just did not want anything to do with that. So, you know, when I look at the situation with Jalen Ramsey, I, I, I do have a small amount of empathy for what he could be going through in his mind. Uh, because it does happen to players. And it's not, and believe you me, it's the last thing a player wants to do. More often than not, the last thing a player wants to do, especially to the team that drafted them, is say that they don't want to be with that team anymore. There is a bit of uh, of a uh, obli uh, uh, obligatory loyalty towards the team that drafted you, for you to give it everything you have and to do everything you can as a player to help that team build to a greater level of success because of the pride and the uh, gratitude that you have for that team taking a chance and drafting you when they could have drafted uh, any number of different players. So I can have a little bit of empathy for uh, Jalen Ramsey in his situation, but I still don't agree with how he approached it. I don't agree with him, you know, uh, lashing out, you know, and I don't, it doesn't matter what the situation was or whose fault it was lashing out. Yes, it happens on the sideline, but it's never something that's encouraged. And, you know, just throughout his career with the kind of attitude he's had, I understand that there needs to be some kind of bravado, some kind of ego for a player of his at his position in a skill position. That's much different than me as an offensive lineman. An offensive lineman who acts like that ain't going to be around long. But, you know, he is an elite level player and he has elite level talent. And unfortunately, sometimes the attitude uh, can can be, you know, a bit of a turnoff for some, but it's also a part of his personality. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you, you, the good and the bad, that's just how it is. Uh, but I just wanted to give a little bit of insight into the mentality that he could be dealing with right now, what he could be dealing with on the inside, because he wants to win. And when I was in Jacksonville, I wanted to win. And part of my love for being in Jacksonville was that, in those years with Del Rio, it felt like we were so close. You know, we went three seasons in a row where we went uh, seven and nine, uh, I think uh, eight and eight, seven and nine, and we missed the playoffs on the last game of the season. We were playing for something up until the last game of the season, which you can't complain about that. If you're a football player, be a play when December comes and you're still playing for something, when you're still playing with the chance to get into the postseason, I mean, that alone, you know, built a sense of pride for me being in Jacksonville because I knew that we were just a little, we were, we were that close. And we just couldn't get over that hump. 
to get back to where we were uh, my rookie year when we when we went into the divisional round and lost to the New England Patriots. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of perspective because I know there's a lot of emotions around this whole Jalen Ramsey situation in Jacksonville. I know that there it's a bit it's a divisive situation. You got people on each side of the argument. Uh, but from a player who played in Jacksonville, who played his entire career in Jacksonville, I can tell you that there are moments that players do crack a little bit. And there are moments where players do have thoughts of wanting to get out and look for greener pastures. Uh, and those and the circumstances around those can vary. Uh, in in Jalen Ramsey's situation, maybe it's not just that 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 uh, completion not being reviewed. Maybe it's a, that was just the uh, straw that broke the camel's back. But in reality, uh, you know, this is something that's been building up in him over the years, and he's probably been pushing it down because of his loyalty to the city and his pride in being a Jaguar and seeing the success that they've had. Uh, particularly in the 2017 season, getting to the AFC title game. When you get a taste of that, that's all you want. When you get a taste of that kind of success, that's all you want. And you feel like that's what it should be like moving forward because now you've shown you can do it one time. So you expect the franchise to be able to uh, help keep you in the position to do that over and over and over. And when it doesn't happen, disappointment, anger, frustration, all these things can set in. So let's keep those things in mind as we watch this whole situation with Jalen Ramsey play out. Uh, hit the like button if you like this video. Subscribe to The Observant Lineman. Hit the notification bell so you can receive notifications whenever I drop new windows. Appreciate everybody. Check out my Patreon as well if you'd like to uh, donate to that. I'm working on some new projects that I'm going to have coming forward in the future. And uh, obviously... Uh, I'd like to see if we can get that crowdfunded a little bit rather than Ooch having to go into his old pockets to pull out cash for that. So I uh, appreciate everybody who watches my videos, uh, and we will catch you on the next Observant Lineman episode. Peace.